Time of Wonder by Robert McCloskey Out on the islands that poke their rocky shores above the waters of Penobscot Bay, you can watch the time of the world go by, from minute to minute, hour to hour, from day to day, season to season. You can watch a cloud peep over the Camden Hills 30 miles away across the bay. See it slowly grow and grow as it comes nearer and nearer. See it darken the hills with its shadow. And then, see it darken one after the other. Islesboro, Western Island, Pond Island, Hog Island, Spectacle Island, Tubush Island. Darken all the islands in between until you on your island are standing in the shadow watching the rain begin to spill down way across the bay. The rain comes closer and closer. Now you hear a million splashes. Now you even see the drops on the water, on the age-old rocky point, on the bayberry, on the grass. Now take a breath. It's raining on you. At the water's edge, on a foggy morning in the early spring, you feel as though you were standing alone on the edge of nowhere. You hear a snorting sound from out of, no, out of the nowhere, and you know that, no, you are not alone. A family of porpoise is nearby, rolling over and over, having an acrobatic bref breakfast of herring under the bay. Then, through the fog, you hear Harry Smith, over in Blasto's Cove, start the engine of his lobster boat and go out to pull his traps. Suddenly, there is a ripple and a splash along the shore that makes you jump. It was the wake from Harry Smith's lobster boat, and you smile because you got wet feet that time. The ripple disappears into the fog, and though you cannot see it, you know that it is silently gliding, gliding on its way. Then another distant, unseen splash, and the gulls and cormorants on Two Bush Ledge with their seabird sense of humor, start giggling and laughing because they were suddenly surprised by the wake. Back from the shore, the trees look like ghosts. The forest is so quiet that you can hear an insect boring a tunnel deep inside a log. And that other sound, not the beating of your heart, but the one like half a whisper, is the sound of growing ferns pushing aside dead leaves unrolling their fiddle heads, slowly unfurling, slowly stretching. Now the fog turns yellow, the bees begin to buzz, and a hummingbird hums by. Then all the birds begin to sing, and suddenly, the fog has lifted, and suddenly you find that you are singing too, with the blue water sparkling all around, all around with the blue water sparkling all around. At the height of the summer season, the bay is spotted with boats, with racing sailboats, with cruising schooners, with busy fishing boats, and with buzzing outboards. In the afternoon, you sail among the islands, pushed by gentle breezes. You sail close by Swain's Cove, Cove ledges, where a mother seal is nursing her baby. And then at sunset, with porpoise puffing and playing around your boat, you come about and set a course for the island that is home. The rock on the point of the island is very old. It was fiery hot when the world was new. It was icy cold when, the, when a glacier covered it with, grind, with its grinding weight. This morning the rock is warm in the sun and loud with happy noise of children who have come to spend the day. They dive off the rock and swim, then stretch out dripping in the sun, making salty young silhouettes on the old scars made by the glacier. In the afternoon, when the tide is out, they build a castle out of rocks and driftwood below the spot where they had belly whoppered and dog paddled during the morning. In the evening, when the tide is high again and all your guests have gone, you now row out to the point, feeling lonely, until an owl asks a question. A heron croaks an answer. A seal sniffs softly as he recognizes you, and eider ducks and fish hawks are all listening. All are watching as you row. By the rock you shine a light down into the water. There is a crab on the bottom, where you were playing just this afternoon. He tiptoes sideways through the castle gate and disappears into his watery keep. 
You snap off the light and row toward the dock as the stars are gazing down, the reflections gazing up in the quiet of the night. One hundred pairs of eyes are watching you, while one pair of eyes is watching over all. As the days grow shorter and shorter, there are fewer and fewer boats on the bay, until at last the fishing boats are left. The wind blows brisk from the northwest, rustling the birch leaves. The ferns change from green to yellow to brown. The robins are gone from the lawn and the garden. The swallows have flown from their nests in the boathouse. To take their places, migrating birds from the north stop off to rest on their way south. The crows and gulls fly over, fussing and feuding, and the hummingbirds visit the petunia patch. Mr. Billings flies over, looking for schools of herring. When he sees you waving on the beach, he dips the seaplane's wings in greeting. On some days, the wind is so strong that even the sturdy fishing boats are or not even the sturdy fishing boats are out on the bay. Now is the time for being watchful. At other times, there is not a breath of wind to ripple the reflection of an unusual sky. Now is the time for being prepared. Over in Blastow's Cove, Harry Smith looks at the sky and says, We're going to get some weather. One egg and reach. Clyde Snowman listens to the loons and says, It's a coming. On Cape Rozier, Ferg Clifford listens to the sound of the bell off Spectacle Island and says, She's going to blow. On your island, you feel the light, crisp feeling out of the air, and a heavy stillness take its place. It's time to make a quick trip to the mainland for food and gasoline. It's time to get ready. We're going to have some weather. It's a coming. She's going to blow. In Bucks Harbor are the cruise schooners that Alice Wentworth, the Stephen Tabor, and the Victory Chimes, riding at anchor, anchor to spend the winter. Men are busy putting out extra anchors, pulling up skiffs and rowboats, checking moorings, checking chains, checking pennants getting ready. Take aboard groceries, take aboard gasoline. All of the talk is of a hundred pound anchors, two inch rope, one inch chain, and will it hold? And the weather and when? Mr. Gray strokes his chin and says, with the next shift of the tide. Hurry for home, for there's much to be done, but for the tide is too low. The ledges behind Pumpkin Island are covered with gulls, all sitting solemnly faced in the same direction. There is no giggling and cackling as your wake splashes the ledge today. There is no time for seabird sense of humor. We're going to have some weather. It's a coming. She's going to blow. With the next shift of the tide. Home on the island, you pull in the sailboat, chain the motorboat fast to its mooring, pull the rowboats high off the beach. Mr. Smith hurries by with a boatload of lobster traps that he has been taking up. Over in Swain's Cove, Mr. Billings puts extra lines on the wings of his seaplane. Fishermen put extra lines on the herring boats and the scalloping boats. At Frankie Day's boatyard up Benjamin River and at Hal Vaughn's boatyard up Horseshoe Creek, men are working with the tide, pulling up sloops and yawls, catches and motorboats, shackling chains, tying ropes, making things fast battening down, getting ready. Stack the groceries on kitchen shelves, bring in wood to build a fire, fill the generator with gas, then take one last careful look while the calm sea pauses at dead low water. A mouse nibbles off one last stalk from the garden and drags it into his mouse hole. A spider scurries across his web and disappears into a knot hole. All living things wait while the first surge of the incoming tide ripples past Eagle Island, ripples past Urigo, past Pickering, past Tubush Island. The bell buoy off Spectacle Island sways slightly with the ripple. Tolling, 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 the shift of the tide. Gently, at first, the wind begins to blow. Gently, at first, the rain begins to fall. Suddenly, the wind whips the water into sharp, choppy waves. It tears off the sharp tops and slashes them into ribbons of smoky spray. 
and the rain comes slamming down. The wind comes in stronger and stronger gusts. A branch snaps from a tree. A gull flies over, flying backward, hoping for a chance to drop into the lee of the island. Out in the channel, a tardy fishing boat wallows in the waves, seeking the shelter of Buck's Harbor. A tree snaps above the roar of the hurricane you see and feel, but do not hear it fall. A latch gives way. People and papers and parcheesi games are puffed hair over eyes across the floor, while father pushes and strains to close the, and bolt out the storm. Mother reads a story, and the words are spoken and lost in the stream of the wind. You are glad it's a story you have often heard before. Then you all sing together, shouting, Eyes have seen the glory, just as loud as you can shout, with dish towels tucked by door sills, just to keep the salt spray out. The moon comes out, making a rainbow in the salty spray, a promise the storm will soon be over. Now the wind is lessening, singing loud chords in the treetops. Lessening, it hums as you go up to bed. And the great swells coming in from the open sea say, Shh, 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 as they foam over the old rock on the point. Lessening, the wind whispers a lullaby in the spruce branches as you fall asleep in the bright moonlight. The next morning you awaken to an unaccustomed light made by the frosty coating of salt on the windows. And out of doors in the gentle morning lie remainders of yesterday's hurricane. Fallen and broken trees are everywhere, on the terrace, on the path, blocking your way at every turn. You cannot walk on familiar paths and trails, but you can explore the tops of giant fallen trees and walk on trunks and limbs where no one has ever walked before. Then, seeking out still more places where no one ever walked before, you explore the jagged holes left by roots of fallen trees. Under an old tree by the house you discover an Indian shell heap, and poking in the thousands of snow-white clam shells, so they crumble at the touch. You realize that you are standing on a place where Indian children stood before the coming of white men. Now it is time for one last chore of hauling seaweed from the beach to fertilize the garden. Spreading the seaweed with its iodine smell, you are pleased to see that the storm-flattened sunflowers are once more lifting faces to the sun. And here are the hummingbirds humming a hymn to the morning, making a final round to the last of the petunias. It is time for hummingbirds to leave the island. It is the end of another summer. It is time for you to leave the island too. Goodbye to clams and mussels and barnacles, to crows and swallows, gulls and owls, to sea urchins, seals and porpoises. It is time to reset the clock from the rise and fall of the tide. To the come and go of the school bus, pack your bag and put in a few treasures, some gold feathers, a few shelves, a book of pressed leaves, a piece of quartz that came from an old crack in the old rock on the point. And children, don't forget your toothbrushes. Then all aboard and around Deer Isle, past Birch Island, past Pumpkin Island, and across Egamagan Reach for the last time this year. Take a farewell look at the waves and sky. Take a farewell sniff of the salty sea. A little bit sad about the place you were leaving, a little bit glad about the place you were going. It is a time of quiet wonder, for wondering. For instance, where do hummingbirds go in a hurricane?